Greetings from London. This is Mariam Sharif, and I have a very special episode this week. It's our 50th episode. Can you believe it? Oh my gosh, 50, <laughs> half a century. Can't believe it. So I thought I'd bring on a really special guest, and she's actually like a friend of mine. She's an artist and author, and probably one of the most elegant and humble people I know. So uh, I'm honored to introduce Aisha Khan. Hi, Mariam. Thank you for that very nice introduction. How are you? It's It's been such a long time since we've, uh, we've reconnected, but it's just, you haven't changed a bit, I must say, mashallah. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot has happened since the last time we met, I assure yeah. you. When we spoke again, uh, you you said that I've actually wrote, written a book, uh, and I was like, oh, really? I didn't know you were an author. So Not an author. Let's clarify this. I'm not an author. Yeah. And this book really came about by chance. Yeah. Because I um, had met some friends of mine um, for coffee, and I thought I was just going to meet them for a coffee. And one of them was um, Charlotte Rayani. She was in charge of the MA degree course of fine art at the Aga Khan University. And um, Mujtaba Shah, who was one of the lecturers at the university. Right. And I had given Mujtaba Shah um, a copy of my MA degree dissertation to read. Right. When yeah. he came um, to see me at the um, at the private view that I had my, of my very first commercial art exhibition um, right. in 2008. So um, we met up for coffee and I thought we were just going to catch up. You know, it was just so nice to, to meet up with them like three three months after. But they had other things in mind. So Charlotte um, wanted to collaborate with ING Bank to have an art exhibition in my honour. So right. both of them had come to my art exhibition, which was in 2008, hosted and sponsored by Lloyd's TSV. And because they liked the content of the exhibition and loved the work, um, they wanted me to have an exhibition six months later at the ING Bank. So that's what that was the intention of Charlotte meeting with me right. and Mujtaba Shah just thought it would be a really good idea for me to, to translate this dissertation into a book. Wonderful. Publish a book. So yeah. that's how it started. I mean, I had no intentions of ever writing a book. I'm a painter. I'm an artist. You know, yeah. okay, writing a book is also being creative but this is not fiction it is more about um, the 10 years of my life during 2007 and 2017 so right. by no means is it an autobiography at all yeah. it is about um, during this period um, of 10 years um, between this time of 2007 and 2017 it yeah. was um what I had been through and I went through some very sort of emotional um, poignant and life-changing experiences yeah, um, and it's so, called a journey from me to you that's right so and yeah. I wanted to share this from me me being the author and yeah. you being the the, the the reader yeah and um and some of them were challenging uh, while others made me look at life from a very spiritual and positive perspective let me, I want to um, let the audience know that your actual background is fashion and you actually yes. taught at London College of Fashion as a lecturer, right? I so did, when yeah. I met you, at because we obviously bumped into each other at events and, um, you know, at red carpet events or charity events and, you know, over the years. And uh, one thing that I, I did notice that your, your personal style was very elegant, very kind of um, simplistic, but really elegant if I was to describe it. But you do have, uh, and then when we spoke, you actually told me that you had a background in fashion and fashion is how you started. So how did you, uh, you know, go from fashion to art? Was that a smooth transition? Okay. No, not at all, not at all. So um, I was very fortunate. Um, so my first degree, my first degree um, was in fashion design from the London College of Fashion. And I was fortunate enough at my graduate graduation show that I was one of the very, very few students who was headhunted, not headhunted, but picked 
from the final collection and given a position as an assistant designer to work in a design studio, which I did for about six months. But I knew there was more to me than just, you know, because I looked at the senior designers and I thought, well, if I stayed here any longer, yeah. that's where I'm going to sort of be promoted mm. to. And this isn't what I wanted. So yeah. I literally left and, um, and I started doing freelance work and right. I opened up my own boutiques. And then I had my own boutiques for about five years and I was a pioneer of East West fashion in this country. Yeah, because I was going to say in those days, a woman, 80s, wanting to go into fashion anyway. I mean, that's quite a brave move. You're, you're quite brave in that respect to go into uh, an arena that is not probably um, mostly discovered or even entered as a, you know, a Muslim female. Mariam, I've never ever looked at myself as being a Muslim, yeah. an Indian, of ethnic origin, or a female. We were just in this always, country, Aisha. Yeah, I was born in Bombay. Right. I've always right. looked at myself as a person, as yeah. an individual. So I've never ever sort of pigeonholed myself in yeah. any any one of these categories that you've yeah. just brought up. And I just looked at it as, you know, this is what I'd like to do. That mm -hmm. I've got the support of my parents, which is yeah. the most important thing. I had yeah. the most wonderful childhood and upbringing, and I had the most amazing parents and grandma, who brought me up with the with the balance, the liberal balance that I have between being a Muslim with moral and religious values and being liberal at the same time, being brought up in a very democratic household, thanks to dad. <laughs> anyway, bless them all. God rest their souls in peace. Sadly, none of them are with me at the moment. Nice. Anyway, so the book is a lot about that as well. You know, where I share a lot about life and death and coming to terms with all of this. Right. Um, anyway, so um, going back to fashion. So yeah. I was a pioneer of East West. And um, basically what I did was I tried to create something that was never done in this country before. So right. I took a sari and I cut up a sari and made it into, you know, like a bias yeah. and different multicolored a bias. I thought, you know, why should a woman only wear a black abaya yeah, you know, yeah as long as she's covered conservatively yes and doesn't cause attention to herself much in yeah. a, and and doesn't reveal any close contours of her body in any shape or form yeah. then you know let's do that then i took bought fabrics and i and i changed the 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 the, the way one looked at shalwar kameez so I cut up the tunics, made it really short into jackets, the yeah. shudvar where you've got the little godets in the middle, you know, to, yeah. to add the extra fullness into the pants. Yeah. I made them into like contrast fabrics. Yeah. So I'd have a stripe on the outside and a, and a check on the inside and I'd play around with colours and textures and yeah. I shortened the jacket and I raised the waistband so the trousers became more like gaucho pants. Yeah. And, um, and so um, East and I, did a show on me Wonderful. in the 80s, probably way before your time, Mariam. <laughs> Eastern Eye. So I was on Eastern Eye. Oh, I do remember Stars, Eastern Eye. <laughs> Stars, Stars and Style and Network East. So these were the three oh, yes. programs at that time, which were very much about Eastern heritage and, and yep. you know, for the Eastern um, audience. Mm. And then I was also um, some of so, um, Maliha Lodi's um, mother. Right. Bless her. She was, she was, she wasn't, um, Melida, her Lodi was a former ambassador to the UK. Yeah. I worked at the High Commission, actually. She, right. I, I worked yes. with her. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. her mother saw one of these shows right. and she came with one of her friends to my boutique right. and asked me if I would do a fashion show at one of their SOS charity events. Oh, yes. And yes, things yes. just sort of mushroomed, you know, yeah. since then. And things just went from strength to strength. And then I opened up my boutiques and when and I had my boutiques for five years and I wasn't very maternal at all. Yeah. And um, <laughs> so, so just so really, I, really kind of focused on your work. And yeah. Yeah. And trying to, and, and sort of, you know, trying to make a name nationally yeah. and yeah. internationally. But then when I conceived and became pregnant and I just thought to myself, the easiest thing for me to do was to get a nanny. Yeah. give sole control of my baby 
yeah. and me while I focus on um, my brand, my label, on Aisha right. Khan, and and I thought no, something's going to suffer. Yes, and because you cannot be a good successful mother and yeah. a good successful businesswoman at the same time. Right, that's your belief. That, that is my belief. Yeah. That is my belief, and I think and I think while women do juggle things yes. around this is just my own personal yeah. belief and I'm sure there are other very successful business women who have juggled this and probably have done a very good job with their children yes but my old so-called old-fashioned belief I didn't think I could do that you know because right. if my name became bigger it would require me traveling away from home more you know, attention international yeah. events international events and I just did not know how I would have been able yeah. to balance something like yeah. that yeah yeah and so one something would have suffered and it would have been my girls so you said that you weren't very maternal yeah. so how I didn't want to have, have babies I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to have babies I didn't oh, want you to didn't. Have children. no I just wanted to have lots of boutiques <laughs> well, they were your for myself but you know you have this maternal instinct that sort yeah. of kicks in your body and it just so happened that you know um through through time and and, and it just happened I just conceived right. and that's when I decided that I was going to give up my boutiques right give okay. up my business and I was going to focus on not being a housewife because I was never I don't like the term housewife anyway. Mm, I don't like it. But I was, and, and, and I wasn't yeah. going to be a full-time mother either yeah. because I wasn't into Goo Goo Gaga 24-7 either. Yeah, yeah. But I was going to do something whereby I kept in touch with both fashion and became you know, and was still in touch with being a mother. Yeah. But lo and behold, because I got on very well with the heads of departments at London College of Fashion and I right. kept in touch with them. And it was, a very, it was very much like a family in those days. I mean, like yeah. university and colleges are very different to yeah. what they are, what they were then. Yeah. So one of my lecturers who I was very close to, um, I discussed this with him and told him that I was closing down the shops one after the other, which I did. Right. And he then mentioned this to the dean of the department right. who called me and said, Aisha, with your background and your experience in yeah. fashion and designing and retail um we would love to invite you to being a part-time lecturer at the london college of fashion wonderful so i did that how did you feel about teaching did oh my you... god and i actually said that i said hang on i said i have no teaching experience <laughs> do i not need to do like a yeah Ecom or whatever, but whatever the qualification was to, to, yeah. to the teacher's qualification. He said, no, because A, you're only part time and B, you are sharing your your in, industry knowledge yeah, with, more like with, mentoring, with the yeah. students. Yeah. So I said, OK, fine. And then they started me off on, you know, the, the, the very sort of lowest um, certificate for, for, for design. Right. And within five years, I was doing teaching final year HMP Oh my students. gosh, how and wonderful. It was just so, so wonderful. So low. I absolutely loved everything. I can, I can imagine you being but, such an amazing yeah. teacher. And then, but then again, although I was only there two days, sometimes three days. Yeah. So I had a commitment and my students looked forward to seeing me every yeah. week. But then if I had a problem with the girls, they may have had a... Um, uh, they were unwell or they needed, you know, the, you know, or the nanny had decided to leave or whatever, then yeah. I, you know, I couldn't just drop that one day session and just go off and, and then take the day off because I know I'd be letting those students down. Yeah. So I'd have to call mummy up or grandma up and say, you know, I need to drop the girls to you. Is that okay? You know, and I did that. I juggled that for five years and then there came a time when I thought well I'm doing the final year HRD students I think you know I I, I feel I felt a sense of achievement I had a really good relationship with my students they yeah. you know we had a lovely lovely rapport and they'd come to the boutiques to, to talk to me you know oh, wonderful. because if I taught the first year and then I moved on to the second year then they had somebody else and you know and they just wanted they just liked my style of teaching yeah. which and I covered basically by the way my room from setting the brief the initial design brief so let's say for example it may have been okay today you're going to 
I'm going to set you a brief on doing a design collection for beachwear. Right. Now, it's up to you to decide which price bracket, which age group, who the market is going to be for, you know, the retailers, etc. the retailers are aiming for. You need to go and do research to have a sense of inspiration. Why should I, as a buyer, look for, you know, be more interested in your collection, Mariam, as opposed to this person's collection? Yeah. And it's all yeah. about where you get your, and how you, you get your source of inspiration because a bikini is a bikini, a swimming costume is a swimming costume, a cover yeah. up and a sarong is what it is. But it's that inspiration, that, that, that level of detail and research that makes that one collection different to the other. Yeah. And the creativity ability, the creative ability of the student also. So yeah. then we'd, we'd go through the development sheets, we would then follow it through to which items you would select to actually pattern cut, yeah. take it into sample room practice, and then see the final outfit, because it was only one outfit fine mm -hmm. for the final collection right. um, on the catwalk. And it was great. And just so that, and then from there, yeah. I then um, needed to be kept mentally stimulated. Yes, I, yes. I, I was not doing fashion anymore. Yeah. Um, and I decided to teach my girls, they were now nine and 10. Right. And the one regret I had was not to bring them up in um, speaking their mother, my mother tongue. And I decided I have one of two choices, either to have an Urdu teacher right. and bring them up speaking and reading and writing and understanding Urdu. Yeah. Or having an Arabic teacher. Right. And the Arabic teacher would teach all three of us. Yes. Arabic as a language, yeah. the history of Islam, Wonderful. and, and um, the history of Islam, and also any discussions that my girls would have, or anything that they were uncertain about, as far as their faith was concerned. So I used to have a two hour session with the girls um, on a Sunday, because I went to school, Monday to Friday, and then on a Friday morning, I used to have a separate two hour session with the Arabic teacher. Like none of us are brought up in a religion or a faith through choice. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I actually address that in my book. Right. None of us. We are brought up in a, we are born into a faith of our parents. Yes. Absolutely. And our grandparents and great grandparents. Yeah. And they bring us up according to their minimal knowledge, knowledge. their way of understanding the faith. Yes. Or no, or no understanding, or they bring yeah. us up without any faith, right? Yeah. But we are in their hands, and it is the faith that we are born into. And I was brought up, so my, both my parents worked as civil servants, and I was brought up, uh, so, so my grandmother taught us whatever we know about our reading of the Quran, when right. most of us completed the Quran in okay. Arabic by the age of seven. We right. fasted from the age of seven, eight, the whole month of Ramadan. Yes. We knew how to do our namaz, our salah, but it was all through blind faith. Right. This, is, this is your faith, you don't question it. Allah, okay. there's only one God. There is that no is God exactly, but God. It, that's know. exactly how I, you're right. Yeah. 100% yeah. how we're, we're born into religion. And uh, and we're, no questions we're do, asked. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, you go to madrasa, you go to synagogue, or you go to church, Sunday school, whatever. This is it. Yeah. But I didn't want my girls to be brought up like this. And I have utmost respect for my grandmother. She did a great job, because, but she didn't know any better because in those days that's what it was. Yeah. Um. And even today, I'd say, Mariam, even today, a lot of parents don't bother taking the trouble to understand their true yeah. faith or teaching, bring their children up with the true understanding. And, you yeah. know, each and one come to their own. That's the most important because okay. even when I was growing up, I would say, okay, well, why are we reading like a parrot fashion? I want to understand because it's only through understanding yeah. the words that you can connect. Yes. And yes. then they make meaningful and then they, they touch your heart. But yes. I, I guess that's the reason why not many uh, have that importance because they have no understanding of actually the words that they speak or the words that they yeah. need. Again, it's up to us to educate ourselves. So you started this journey through uh, your grandmother 
and then yeah. obviously educating your children. Um, and and I, that was the I, best decision I made. What, what, you said you, you weren't motherly or you, weren't, you didn't have that maternal instinct. And then obviously having children and raising them. What do you think is the biggest lesson of having children? But um, because I, I can only speak for myself, Mariam. Yes. I really can because like I was telling my daughters only the other day, I said yeah. being a parent is very much a trial and error situation. Right. It really yeah. is because every child is different, every parent's different. And you know, and I said the most important thing, the most important thing is patience and tolerance with a child, two, love and affection. Yes. And three, just to be there for them. And because I am an all or nothing person, yes, I sacrificed my entire fashion career. Yeah. To be with my girls. And so therefore I did give them my all. Mashallah. But you know, I can only do as much as I can while they are under my roof. Yes, yes. Once you, and I'm very old fashioned as well. Yeah. <laughs> so when the girls went to university and they came home, they said, right mum, you know, and they only lived away for like three months because they wanted to try uni life. And they were enrolled to move out for like a whole year. Yeah. After three months, they were bored. And they wanted to come back home. <laughs> but then three years later, when they graduated, you know, a lot of their friends who had lived away from home for, for three years or so yeah. started having their own apartments and living independently. Yes. Um, and they wanted to have their own apartments. And I said, no way. The day you leave your family home will be the day you get <laughs> married. Married. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just old fashioned like this. And lo and behold, that's, alhamdulillah, that's what happened. And, and mashallah, you have a, a beautiful uh, grandsons. Four of them now, and it's yeah, about mashallah. 20 months. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know that. It's a new additions to the family, mashallah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, um, Aisha, how did you make that transition from fashion to art then finally? So, as I was saying, that I hired the Arabic teacher yeah. to teach the girls. Around Islam and is and learning Arabic as a language and being able to speak in Arabic, which the three of us can, but in a very sort of elementary way. Yes. And then you know we did a lot of writing and, and grammar, and there was a lot of Arabic text that we and script that we would write in right. our books. Okay. And I just fell in love with the Arabic text and the arabic script and i just thought, okay so that's where your was discovery lovely. was yeah, yeah wow fantastic so that's when i thought i'd like to do something with this arabic language with this arabic script this text right. you know then the, yep. so i hired a, a professional arabic calligrapher right who, who used to come to my house once a month and he told me by the name of abu mustafa and he told me all I needed to know about the different types of Arabic calligraphy and the different types of ca uh, calligraphic scripts. And I was just drawn towards the Kufic script. And the name comes from um, a place called Kufa in Iraq. And it was the very first form of Arabic, um, Arabic script. Um, and letters and formation of, of the Arabic language. Right. And what I liked mo most about the Kufic script is the angular stylized form of each letter. And so he showed me that, you know, what um, the reed pe pen was, which is what everybody uses to do Arabic call calligraphy. Right. He, he brought a few for me and Basically, I started right from the beginning, writing the 28 letters um, of the Arabic um, uh, language, uh, yeah. alphabet, the Arabic alphabet. Yeah. And, um, and I would just practice, I would just practice for week on week, month on month, and then we just progressed from, you know, putting words together. And then with my fashion background, I stylized the yeah. Kufic script to my own style, style of Arabic calligraphy. And because I wanted people to think, to recognize my work just by looking and seeing my style yeah. of Arabic the signature, calligraphy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, as a signature of my work. And so 
that's how I started. And then I decided right. that I wanted to now apply this to a form of fine art. Now, of course, I didn't know much about fine art in the sense, yes, I did art O level. Yes, I did art A level, but my art A level was specialized in textile design. Right. And then when you're, a, when you're a fashion student, it's all about illustrations. It's not about fine art as such, mm. and it's more graphics. So I went, I enrolled into some short courses at Central St. Martins, and oh. I did a, a, a course in watercolors, a course in mixed media, and a course in oil painting. And just to have an understanding of what yeah. fine art is all about. And I really enjoyed oil painting and mixed media. Right. And thereafter, I then enrolled into Kensington and Chelsea College to do these professional development courses, which they have these sort of units per term. Yes, for, yes. For, for, for students that have, or people that have, that were into fine art before and left it for a certain while and wanted to come back to sort of brush up right. on it. So I did a couple of units in that. And then, of course, every time I did that, I'd, I'd apply my Arabic calligraphy mm. into, into whatever project was set to me by the, by the lecturers. Yes. And I just got so involved. And initially, it started off as a hobby. Yes. And I really enjoyed it, even right up until the three-year HNC course that I did, or right. HNC, I can't remember, at Kensington and Chelsea. And every piece of work had Arabic calligraphy. It all had to do with the Quran, the, the phrases from the Quran, you know, mentioning the name Allah, writing Allah in, 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 in within the composition of my paintings. Wonderful. And then I thought, no, I really want to do this as a profession. Yeah. And if I didn't do an MA, people, because the art world is such a snooty world. It is yeah. so snooty. It is more snooty than the fashion world. Fashion. Yeah. Because there's more money in the art world. Yeah, much more money in the art world. And I just thought, yes, I'd like to do this professionally. But if I just did it, for, if I just continued from where I am now, which is right, having right. an AKC, um, I don't think the art world would take me seriously because of my background in fashion. Fashion, right, right. And so I decided to do an MA in fashion in, in fine art Why as not? late. I think I must have been 48 when I did that. Wow, Marcia. And um, I got a place at Central St. Martins and I did the two year part time course, um, which worked very well for me because I had my grandmother that I was nursing at the time. So if the one year full time course just wouldn't have worked. Right. So I enrolled into the two year part time course, which was great. And I graduated from CSM. And Fortunately, I was, um, I had my first show in two, 2007, actually, at the House of Lords. Right. My first commercial show was sponsored by Lloyd's TSB, and that was soon after graduating. And my first commercial show in a commercial gallery was in 2011 at the Albemarle Gallery. And it just sort of spiralled from yeah. there. So Alhamdulillah, you know, it all went. So what does spirituality mean to you? I've been on this spiritual path over the past 20 years. It yeah. started off with something that my grandmother said. Yeah. So I became more of a instigated them, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I became yeah. more of a practicing Muslim. Yeah. Then something that my mother said, which also resonated and stayed with me since then. And that was also around 20 years ago. Right. And that was, um, you know, alhamdulillah, things were going really well for me and yeah. my family with children children with work with business with everything yeah. and you know th th there was this element of fear in the sense that you know this balloon is going to burst so I said right. to my mom one day and I said mommy I said you know I've got this fear within me that you know mashallah alhamdulillah everything's going so well that yeah. I have this fear that one day this balloon is going to burst oh. and she said bitter she said the balloon will never burst the until the day it probably burst the day you die but oh. the balloon will get smaller the balloon will get bigger but it'll never burst but what mm. you need to do is while the going is good for you mm. is to remember Allah and thank him thank him on a daily basis and if you do this remember him and thank him on a daily basis 
when the going is good for you, he will always be there for you in time of need. Amazing. That was something she said, because, you know, when you think about it, when mashallah, and things are going really well for you, you're, yeah. so, you're so involved in that lifestyle, that, that, that fast lane, that, you know, yes. being on that treadmill all the time. And, you know, you've got to be here, you've got to be there, you've got to, you know, and, and yeah. it's very easy. It's very easy to just forget that spiritual element. And get lost, and get lost, get lost in that world. And get, well, absolutely get lost yeah. in it. So by mummy saying that to me, that mm. just stayed in my, in my, it was deep rooted in my heart. And that was another thing. So of course, by doing that. So, you know, I started reading the Quran more. I started sort of like questioning my existence in this world, the purpose of life and all of that. Yes. And then I just thought to myself, you know, I need to know what this is all about you know what is this what is this world all about what is life all about what is my yeah. purpose in this world all about right. and i thought i'm going to actually study the quran with proper translation and tafsir yes and the tafsir that i read was an edition of six volumes by maulana modudi and the beauty about reading tafsir the translation with the tafsir is that it puts everything into context. Yes. And as I was reading and gaining knowledge, mm. I was like so elated. Yes. I yes. was like on an, in another world. And I just thought, how can I yeah. just, I can't just keep this knowledge yes. within myself. I need to share this. Right, I need right. to share this with the world. Yeah. And the only that that's when I thought that I'm going to share this knowledge with the world through my art. Ah, oh, yes. And that's how I started with using a lot of the verses from the Quran, but very short, very brief. Yes, yes. And you'll see a lot of my earlier works had some form of phrases or verses from the Quran. Um, in an Arabic calligraphic form yes, as part of the overall composition of my work. So I'd write things like, so, so, so my, some of my paintings that have um, a, convey a, a phrase like, Ashkur Allahi Da'iman, thank God always. Mm. Um, Dhikr Allahu Akbar, the remembrance of God is great. Mm. Inna Allahu Ma'asabirin, you know, indeed God is with those who are patient. Mm -hmm. So I'd do, and then I'd just have Allah on a painting. Right. And then, um, and that's, that's what the earlier, the earlier works of mine were all about. And, the, and, and, and my work in general, in general, my work is about the creation of the universe and its creator. Right, right. Being Allah, to, yes. who I also term as being the sublime. Yes. Right. And... But it was only when I went to Mecca. I went to right. Mecca in 2007. Okay. And I was one of three million people sitting there in Haram Sharif. When you go for a pilgrimage, it has to change your heart and it has to, um, you know, you come back changed. So tell me about your pilgrimage and, and uh, what did you what it was the realization a fabulous, it was a fabulous pilgrimage it really oh, was and, okay. and i did an umrah i think five years before that right right um and i must admit when you're in mecca yes the practices of the faith is so much easier yes everyone is doing the same thing yeah everyone dresses the same everyone drops what they're doing you know at the call of the adhan at the call yes. of prayer it is just so much easier. Yes, yes. But of course, you know, when you're there and like I was sitting in front of the Kaaba and I was this pin drop silence. Yeah. And I was one of three million people there. And mm. you look around and you think, we are all here. Yeah. The sole purpose, soul as in S O U L also. Yeah. <laughs> right yourself and for the sole purpose of worshiping 
Allah. Allah, yes. But where is Allah? You couldn't see him, you couldn't hear him, and yeah. you couldn't touch him. Mm. And yet, through his absence, through this abstraction, through his, uh, through the abstraction of not having him anywhere around you, you could sense his presence yes. all around you. Yes. And you have goose pimples on your arms and you have yeah. this certain certain feeling that sort of penetrates through your heart. Yeah, yeah, and absolutely. Like, oh my gosh, you know, and, and while all this was going on in my mind, I thought to myself, I don't need to have Arabic calligraphy or the, the or the remembrance of God in the form of Allah in my paintings all the time. Right, right. They're nice when they're there, and I will continue to always do that because I yeah. it, it's it's part of what my work is about. It's what, yeah. part of what I'd like to share with the world. Mm. But I would now like to start becoming more abstract in my work, and as long as I can create a presence of Allah or uh, create some form of luminos luminosity within my work that, 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 that creates a presence of Allah within my work, I'm happy to also go down the abstract route. And right. so you will see through certain paintings, uh, which I'll email to you, which you can share with, with the, your audience yes. when you're editing this. Um, how the difference between day and night as my earlier works yes the difference between day and night after it came back from um mecca that'd be wonderful what attending one of your exhibitions and um I, I i think i profiled you first for uh celebrity style and whilst my you know our conversations and you know we had i was writing an article on you it was so fascinating that actually you have this really spiritual site you showed me your exhibition your studio which i'm also going to share with the audience later but uh, and then obviously I attended the one of your exhibitions and you did a beautiful exhibition on the 99 names of Allah. Can you explain a little bit about the concept of that? Because that was beautiful. That, that really was. Just again, another form of yeah. trying to understand who Allah is, yeah. what is it all about through his beautiful names, Al-Asma Al-Husna, through his attributes, and many of those attributes we as human beings should also have within us. So we should also be more compassionate. We should also be more forgiving. We should also yeah. be more generous. We should also be more loving, you know? And these are certain attributes of Allah, which we as human beings should also have. So when I created this installation, I created in a, in a manner that I wanted, because we all have Allah's spirit within us, all of us, right? We all have Allah's spirit within us. And I wanted to create it in such a form whereby I've put these acrylic hemispheres on, I'm trying to create a three-dimensional effect within a two-dimensional painting. Yes. And so the whole um, series of work was um, inspired by architectural forms. Right. Because to me, I just felt that this whole world is so divided. Yes. And how can I how can I represent an element of division within my work? And I was just sitting in Starbucks one day and I'm looking around and living in this metropolis of a city, you know, yeah. surrounded by buildings and architecture. And you think, well, where there's architecture, there's structure, where there's structure, there's division. Mm -hmm. So my series of work for the elements of nature was um, inspired by architectural forms. So you'll see there's lots of structure and division and whatever, which represents division as far as I'm concerned. But then as a paradox to the division, I've yeah. put these circular hemispheres yeah. onto, these, onto these paintings, these yeah. 99 canvases. 
And what these hemispheres represent is one of two things. One is wholesome. I know it's in half, but I couldn't get a whole. I couldn't get yeah. a whole sphere <laughs> onto a two-dimensional. So, yeah. so I was happy with just a hemisphere yeah. representing wholesome um, because, um, you know, unity is an element of wholesome. The world is whole. Yeah. It's Allah is unity. He's one. And I just felt that that represented oneness, unity, and wholesome. And then when you stood in front of any one of those canvases and also did a big one titled The Omniscience, which is Allah, and yeah. behind the big hemisphere, I've, I've painted Allah in white. So it's all, it sort of almost illuminates through the hemisphere. Oh, right, right. And when you stand in front of it, you can see your reflection through that big hemisphere and you sort of like resonate Allah's spirit within you oh and that's then, beautiful and so, and so and when I wanted and the way I wanted these 99 names to be um displayed and exhibited at the Albemarle gallery yes was I wanted all four walls in the in, in the lower part of the gallery to yes. have the 99 names so when any viewer anybody is in that space Yes. They are surrounded by the 99 names yeah. of Allah on all four sides. And yeah. if you stood in front of any one of them, you've got the hemisphere and you could you see your reflection again, you know, in, within in that hemisphere. And yeah. if you're standing in front of a Rahman, for example, you know, you can sort of resonate that, you know, I can also be more, um, more, more um, compassionate. Yes. You know, if you stand in front of al Wadud, I can also be more loving. You know, if you stand in front of al Khafar, I could also be more forgiving. And just in general, you know, the whole ambiance of being surrounded by the attributes of the beautiful names of Allah around you, you yes. just felt a resonance because some of those attributes of Allah should also be some of your attributes as a human being. just listening to you uh, explain your kind of creative process and I, th I think sometimes it's a bit osmosis as well do you not feel that you're kind of those words kind of penetrate into your heart and you start to you that you emotionally so connected to the words that you you take on you know also the words and you you know in your daily life because if something that you're practicing creating writing every single day isn't that part of your being now oh it's very much part of me my being yeah. that my yeah. faith is very much part of me yes part of me and i'd just like to share uh, something that happened when i was doing the 99 names of allah so my mother bless her yeah. she was in a hospice during mm -hmm. the last term of her prognosis oh, okay. she had ovarian cancer so of course I'd go and see her every day from 2.30 right. until whenever she should tell me to go home now, your husband and your children are home now, you need to be home yeah. and oh. be with her during that time. Yeah. Anyways, I'd take my sketchbook with me. So right. I, I interweaved my artwork with the experiences that I had within those 10 years. And so there's a reflection and an inspiration of the experiences that I had with my parents both, and my grandmother in my art and vice versa. So yeah. funny enough, so I'd take this sketchbook of mine, which is this, and I'd go and so this, this, this sketchbook of mine, and this oh. is literally how the 99 names of Allah started, right, oh. literally like this. And then, it, um, and then I added color, hang on, where are we? 
and then I added color and then I added whatever and then it oh, just wonderful. Anyway. so I love I love stages, knowing about someone's creative process yes yeah, so in the initial so nice that you've just gone from step one that raw form yeah, or, yeah. In the sketchbook. So while mommy was going in and out of her naps, you know, I'd be sitting yeah. there and I took my sketchbook with me and I'd start working on the initial stages of the 99 ends, not knowing exactly how it was all going to pan out. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, the day she took her last breath mm. was when I was writing Al Jabbar and Al Aziz. Oh. Al Jabbar is the compeller and mm. only the compeller can take one's life away mm -hmm. and Al Aziz the Almighty. Yes. And yes. that, honestly, that oh. was just the most touching thing ever. And I was the how, only one. How comforting who, as well. How it's comforting. It's just, you know, it just, it, things just, you know, things just fall into place. Now, I, I, I just gave a talk, funny enough, two days ago to the Sufi group on getting to know Allah. Right. And when I was going through, as I said, during this 20 years, I'm on this spiritual path. I'm absolutely yeah. loving it. I'm and Islam is, a, uh, Islam is a, uh, a, a journey. It's, right? a, it's, it's a way of life. It's yes. a way of life. But there's so much in it for you to understand the intuitions yes. that you sort of develop and have during your inquisition of yes. wanting to learn more. And so... One ayah, uh, hang on, it's here. One, I did it only the other day. And one um, ayah, one verse of the Quran that resonated in my, in my, um, within, in, which res not resonated, which was deep rooted in my heart, was right. this um, verse that said, um, right, which said, and indeed we have created man and we know whatever thoughts his inner self develops and we are closer to him than his jugular vein that's the 50th surah called surat al-qaf mm. on 16. so when i read this many years ago this yeah. this verse ayah just de was deep rooted in my heart and i thought right. If Allah is that close to me, mm. he knows my inner self. Mm. How can that be? Because he, at that time, there were like six and a half billion people in the world. Yeah. You know, and I didn't realize up until I, when I read that verse, right. that he was that close to me. Because prior to that, I thought, you know, with all my du'as, with all my, yeah. thinking, with whatever I'm doing, he is Allah, the omniscience. I mean, he hasn't got time to listen to my du'as and my, you know, he's got six and a half billion people to listen to, to, to yeah. worry about, to look after. Who am I? I'm a nobody. But yeah. then after reading that, and I thought to myself, well, beautiful. if he knows my inner self and he is as close to me as my jugular vein, then I want to know him. Yeah. And I want to know him however I whatever it takes me to try and know him as yeah. much as I can, because nobody will ever really get to know Allah in his true form, because yeah. he is what he is. He is so vast. He is, I'm in such awe of him. He is so sublime. He is just, I don't know what shape or form he it, or it yeah. exists in, but I know it's out there. Yeah. But to yeah. think but he is that close to I me. I wanted to actually say something, Aisha, that I was just reading, a, 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 you know, a little bit about Sufism and I, to my understanding, so uh, Sufism also was kind of created to combat this kind of material world that we also mm -hmm. live in and um, to detach from this material world because, you, were, you know, when, when we, the materialism world started, that's when your egos, you know, uh, came into play. And then Sufism is more about, I guess, your inner journey that you have. It uh, is. Yeah. It's yeah. about, and so, so you have, so, so in our order, the Sheikh explains that we have six centers of consciousness within ourselves. Hmm. And he directs you to each center of consciousness the way he feels. Yeah, uh, you should be um, on that on that particular 
hearth or not. So everyone starts on the kalp, which is the heart. Ru is the next one, which mm. is the soul. The third one is um, um, the third one is the secret. The fourth one is the hidden. The fifth one is the most hidden, and the last one is the nafs, which is the ego. Mm, the nafs. So yeah. it so it takes ages. I mean, I was on the cult for many years, you know, and you just focus on the on the heart. Focus yes. on the heart. Then you can focus on the purification of the soul, and then he tells you when you progress from one center of consciousness to the next yes so by the time you've focused on these six centers of five centers of consciousness and yes. by the time you come to the nafs you almost don't have enough anymore mm. the ego is gone which ego's is gone. so lovely it is yeah. so lovely the ego is completely gone and i no longer think with my mind or my brain anymore yeah. unless mm. it's something that's calculative and i need to my brain to to to, to mm. work in that in, in that manner but i just think with my heart now with everything i say and do it comes from the heart yes you know and and also when you think about it when you are doing your sujood mm. five times a day as many times as you're going down in your sujood what are you doing you are at your absolute lowest ebb Yes. you are on all fours yes. right and what and that is the lowest lowest form of any human being to be at any time of their life yes and what are you reciting subhana rabbi al ala subhana rabbi al ala subhana rabbi al ala so what you're basically saying is i am at my lowest ebb i am a nobody i am a speck of dust and allah you are the almighty the all high Yes. How beautiful is that? And so how can you, listen, we all have a nafs. We all still have an ego. Of course we yeah. do. But by training yourself and by going through and being conscious. Conscious, yes. Being conscious of mm. trying to become close to Allah, trying to disconnect with this world, yeah. trying to form a relationship with Allah. Yes. The ego and the nafs almost goes into the subconscious yes you know? and it's no longer in the foreground forefront yeah 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 you know? and and so now when i do stand on my prayer mat i'm not saying that i don't think of material things <laughs> they still happen but it's getting better yeah. day by day it's getting so much better and i'm so much more focused on my prayers yeah that, that yeah it is it's such a it's such a inward uh, you know as the same we, we uh, come from kind of the world of where the exterior you know used to be uh, or is uh, you know a much more focused and there's nothing wrong with looking presentable or uh, you know groomed like you know but I also feel that like it has to be an alignment with the inner and outer you know you yeah. have to, whatever yeah. happens inside dictates your your outside yeah. um you know we've gone through this real challenging 2020 and even now people are still um trying to get through this hardship these challenges what advice would you give them is there something that you can tell us how you've dealt with your challenges and uh what what do you do when you when you have a challenge or a difficulty Okay, um, I always turn to Allah. Okay, mm. and life is full of challenges. And it's not a bed of roses. It would be absolutely boring if it was a bed of roses. And yes. the good thing about having challenges is you can appreciate the good moments. And you know, I'll never forget this is my again, my father. Yeah. So one day I was with him and I don't know, I had a bad day of some description or whatever mm. and dad said bitte you're not your usual normal bubbly self today mm. I said no dad I said I'm not I said I'm in fact I'm having a a bit of a um I'm I'm, I'm struggling to, to to come to terms with something or the other mm. and he said to me bitte just remember if you don't have these down moments you can never appreciate the up moments mm. and he never even asked me what it was I was going through, do I want to talk about it, did not pry at all. Yeah, That's all yeah. he said. And I thought, you know, um, he's so right. And it's, it's, uh, and we all have challenges in our lives. And, and um, 
there's only one of two ways you can deal with these challenges, positive or negative, mm. right? So you've got life goes on, yeah. life goes on, right? Yes. So if you go down the negative route and you wallow in self-pity, yes. if, what, when, why, how, but, you're just going to keep beating yourself up yeah. because you're not going to get out of that rut yeah. of if, what, when, why, how, but like a downward spiral. completely and you're just wallowing wallowing mm -hmm. and just wallowing the other the other aspect is the positive route and that is okay so i'm faced with this challenge now how do i deal with it life goes on so turn to allah do my du'as ask him for guidance and i must just admit istikhara is a great great form of prayer are you a, a believer in Istikhara? Oh, I'm telling you. And <laughs> I haven't. And again, I've mentioned this in my book. Right, my right. book, by the way. Yes. A journey, yeah, from, a journey me. from me to you. Yeah, it's on Amazon. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I don't know whether I'm supposed to be. No, you can say it. It's, it's on Amazon, on everybody. <laughs> but you can get it on Amazon. Um, anyway, so um, I mention it in, in, in my book. Right. And it was in the it's in the last chapter that's titled Trust in God. Right. Okay. And basically, I've only, I think, done Istikhar in my entire life about four times. Right. I, maybe five or four. Okay. Because I, I, I have a friend, Aisha, who does Istikhara like for every job she's going for. She's gonna move to a new house. She's like she literally has so much trust in Istikhara that she will do it like nearly for every big decision and and of course rightly so right because it's a guidance from Allah yeah but like you know each unto their own yes I can only talk through from my experience mm, mm. and because you know you've got to hudge it where Allah comes down to the lowest heaven yes and answers everyone's prayers and du'as and dhikr and the spirit yeah, whatever very powerful so that's also very powerful yeah then you have your sujood you know, you can make dua in sujood, and that's also a, a really good form of asking Allah for mm. du'as and getting close to Allah. Yeah. Istikhara to me is special. And, 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 and it's always been taught to me by my mother and my grandmother that it's a very special right. du'a. Yeah. And it's a du'a that you do when there really is, when you're really in a dilemma. Yeah. So I'll give you a classic example of one example of why I did it. For my MA. Yeah. The MA. So when I was in the final year of the HNC, and that mm -hmm. was in sort of October, October of 2005, I think. Yeah. Right. I decided I wanted to do an MA um, in fine art. Spoke to my girls, Mom, why do you want to do this? You know, you don't need to spend another two years doing this. You're, you're, you know, you've got, you're so talented anyway. Yeah. Just continue doing this as a hobby. Right. Spoke to my parents, Bitter, why do you want to go to college for another two years? You know, your college days are over. <laughs> Spoke to my grandma, the same, <laughs> right? And I thought to myself, okay, now this is something that I really want to do because yeah. I wanted to take my fine art in a professional light okay which none of them of course understood it from my yeah. point of view yes so I did an istikhara and mm -hmm. I in October and I said Allah this is what I'd like to do please guide me accordingly in December I went to Lahore and we bought a house in Lahore because mm -hmm. I love Lahore and I wanted to get I wanted to continue with my philanthropic projects which yeah. I've got a few in Pakistan and right. I thought it'd be great to have a base in Pakistan and from all the cities in Pakistan I just love Lahore oh good so we I'm bought worried. so we bought a house in Lahore <laughs> yeah we exchange contracts and right. we we're going to complete in March the following year right the closing date for the applications for MA is February okay so now the fact that we've exchanged contracts for Lahore and I, the whole house needed re-gutting and need, it was a new project. That event of purchasing the house in Lahore, yes. as far as I was concerned, was a, was a deciding factor of actually you're not doing the MA. 
because you've got this new project to deal with. Right. Now, with istikhara, it is whatever is the final result is the is whatever is the final outcome of the niyat that you made is the result of the istikhara, mm. the final. Okay. Right. So now, but and but during, before you get to that final outcome. Yes, there are events that unravel in front of you. Mm -hmm. They yeah. may be objections, obstacles that come in your way that right. will prevent you from the, 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 the final outcome. Mm -hmm. Or they may be a complete clear path, which will lead you straight to the outcome. Right. But whatever the outcome is, it is the outcome. It is the result that Allah wanted for you. Yes. Because you turn to him for guidance and you put your trust yes. in him during the near of Issachara. Mm -hmm. So come the new year, we've come back to London in January. We've bought a house in Lahore. As far as I'm concerned, there's no MA at Central <laughs> State Martins. Right. What happens? I get a call from the daughter of the, her, the owner of the house that we've bought. Mm -hmm. Hi Aisha, this is whatever her name is, I can't remember. I understand that you, have bought the house my father's house and you're coming in march to complete contracts he said that's right and she said well um my father's not going to sell this house to you i said uh and why is that because her mother had sadly passed away five years before right and her mother had built the house and designed the house etc and the fact that we were going to knock the whole house down which we were you know and she just did not want this to happen so listen while I really sympathize with you, yes, this is not my business. This is not yeah. my problem. You need to yeah. sort this out between you and your father. Right. We're coming in March to complete contracts. Anyway, went to Lahore in March and she, in, she got her other sister from Karachi to come to this meeting. And what a showdown it was. Oh, I just gosh. said, you know, I cannot buy this house. I cannot live in a house that's called, that's got so much negative, negative energy, yes. vibes, upset to other members of the family. I cannot buy no, this. No, it's not a way to start, Aisha, yeah. is it? No. Not so a way then, to begin the new... I said, listen, yeah. whatever deposit we've given for the house, just return yeah. the deposit. Yeah. So, came back to London. It's now March, end of March. Right. I then decide, okay, now I'm going to apply for the MA. So you see the obstacles and the clear yes. paths, right? So I wrote to Central St. Martins. I submitted my, 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 my CD, my portfolio. Oh my God. And I said, I'm really sorry. I know it's a late application, but I'm really sorry. I hope I'm not too late and you can still consider my application for the MA Fine Art in 2006. Yeah, yeah. They wrote back saying, thank you for your application. I'm really sorry, but you are too yes. late for the it's one the year. For the one year full time MA right. course, however, which I didn't even know they had, okay. we had a two year part time course MA. <laughs> Would you consider this? And I was just so over the moon by it. And I thought, yes, of course I would. Oh. And it just so happened, Mariam, listen to this, because had I applied for the one year full time course, my grandma was sent. I, I nursed my grandma from October 2006 until January 2007 when she sadly passed away. She stayed yeah. in my house and she was uh, um, discharged from UCH hospital with TB of the spine. And right. because it was very close to my grandma, I nursed her for like 10 years and it took her to every appointment, hospital appointment. Yeah. So she came and stayed with me. Mm -hmm. Had I got onto the one year MA course, yeah. I would have had to drop out because oh. my grandmother needed my full time needed. attention. Yeah. Whereas the two year part time course, just oh. three days a week, afternoons and evenings, yeah. helped me balance me being with my grandma and being, yeah. she, she sadly passed away four months after, yeah. helped me focus more on the thing. And do you see what I mean? Everything Nobody. was meant to be the way, like it's worked out even more perfectly than you expected. And this is what I'm saying. Yeah. And, the, and the only reason the yeah. only reason, even if it is a bad decision, yeah. even if it is a bad outcome, something yeah. that you, you, you didn't envisage would happen, 
Yeah. You don't feel bad about it because Allah, it was a decision that Allah made for you. Yes. You know, and it's just incredible. You, I've just stopped beating myself up about anything anymore. Now. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> it is. It, yeah. I, it's like I, I I was going through something last year and I was like, I'm just going to hand all my problems to Allah. Like I was just told, just just uh, just get closer to Allah. Just that's it. That's the only thing you can do. Your relationship with Allah should be the strongest and he will help you. And that was and it. In, and every and time I do that. that. Yeah. And every yeah. time. And you'll be surprised that he is so close to you. You know, in the in the grand scheme of things, he is literally here. He's in my mm-hmm. heart anyway. Always, yeah. And so Aisha, what is that picture behind you then? Um, this is a painting that's titled the Inna Lahuma Asabareen. Indeed, Allah is with those who are. Oh, it's very faint. I couldn't see. I couldn't see what's the. Can is you, that meant to be deliberate? Can you zoom in? No, I can't zoom in. But uh, I, I'll zoom in maybe in in the interview. I can send you. I can send you. A, yeah, a yeah, interview. yeah. I didn't know if there was anything that what was written on there because there I is. In the mm, and is that part from which exhibition, or is that just a separate? No, no, the, the, this I created just separately. As oh, well. this is just, so okay, this is just a one-off, just exhibition. separate, okay, yeah. oh, right, right. Yes, yeah. Yeah, is there, yeah. A, is there a reason for those colours? Again, again, as an artist, I'm telling you, when I stand in front of the canvas, even I, as the artist, does not know what the end result is going to be. Oh. I start off with some random colours, Mm-hmm. I haven't pre-planned these colors. I'll just get a whole load of colors. I'll just literally splash them on. I'll yeah. then sort of like merge them all in together. And that that's when the painting is starting to talk to me. I now have a dialogue between myself and the canvas. Right. And then I start painting from the subconscious. So the words came afterwards? Or the, the colors came, came first? Yeah, the words came afterwards. The and because And because... I really liked the colors, which yeah. were so muted, and they were like drawing me more and more into it. Right. And I just thought, and I was, I suppose, quite patient watching all of this sort of transpire and yeah. unfold in front of me. I thought, okay, in the Lahama Asabarin. And when you see, I don't just apply the calligraphy, so it's just like bang. I try yeah. and incorporate the calligraphic text within the overall composition of the art right of the painting so it's all an all-encompassing painting Mm. and and also um like you said i mean even though i absolutely love arabic calligraphy and and arabic calligraphic Mm. art a lot of it i have also experienced is very traditional yes yes and what i am doing is trying to create a hybrid of art yeah. which is again my western upbringing being yeah. inspired by western artists american yeah. expre- american abstract expressionist artists mostly because they were all quite spiritual yeah and then combining that with my eastern islamic heritage yeah and my when you were painting this what, what what emotions were you feeling? What what was going through your mind and your heart? Like you said, like you know, you're obviously connecting with your heart. What what when you paint? What what emotions go through your with your heart? All different, all yeah. different emotions, all different emotions. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't pinpoint to any, but um, there's another painting, in fact, that you have when you styled me. Oh yes, yes. standing with my poncho. Yes, my yes. Beret. If you want yeah. to show that as I'm talking about it, you can yeah. do so. I, I will and, highlight that. Yeah. And that painting is titled "Division of Life." Finish beige, which is earth. The other side is blue, yes. which is the heavens. Mm. The middle, it's sort of like creamish sort of light colors which to me is a is the light of god mm. and underneath it's a whole load of turmoil and that is what life is about turmoil mm. and I, it's it's how i created that turmoil through my textural 
yes. gestural um, brush strokes and techniques that I used. And what was the message that I put in that bottom yeah. bit? In the love of Mata Sabarin, which at that time, I knew the only way you're going to get through life is through utter patience and tolerance. Mm, wonderful. Yeah. Isn't it strange how we, as our perception is, we think we look at, a, you know, a picture or, a, you know, an, a, a piece of art and we can make our own understanding from it. Yeah. And then, yeah. then, you, then you hear uh, the, the artist you know reason why they conceived it what is the meaning behind it and you think oh my god I didn't think about that and it opens your eyes this is why I love art because you see something but you don't really see it you have to kind of feel it see it you have to have all senses kind of working at the same time to really understand what the artist was going through and this is why I love art because to one it means something else to another it'll mean something else it's a completely personal it's subjective it's subjective yeah, but it is subjective yeah. yeah but either way either way it's fine because even if you didn't know me and you didn't know how i just explained that division of life painting yes. whatever that painting does for you also yes. is enough you know a painting should talk to you and if you yes. like that painting if that painting draws you into it if that yeah. painting is talking to you, speaking to you, you're yeah. creating some form of uh, a resonance or a dialogue between, that's also fine without knowing yeah. what was going on in the artist's head. Yes, but the fact right. that, you know, when you go to, you know, if you have a curator-led tour of an exhibition and, yeah. and the curator tells you the thoughts behind the artist, then that's a bonus, you know, and yeah. sometimes you might think, oh, I wish I didn't know that. <laughs> I quite like, in fact, the same thing happened, like with, Jamie. The same thing happened with Jamie in her spot painting. <laughs> I went, in fact, it was the weekend after my grandmother had passed away. Yeah. And there was the London Art Fair at Islington. So right. I went to it and there was Jamie in her spot paintings. Uh -huh. And there were bright colours, there were the same painting in bright colours, pastel colours and shades of grey. Right. And it was sold as three different paintings, not as a triptych. Right. And I thought, oh, I like that one the bright colored one right and he 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 titled it sineal whatever right. sineal is meant to mean i don't know right but to me i had just lost my grandmother mm. the weekend before she was like a baby right yes she was 91 years old when she passed away she was like a baby so mm. she went through this whole circle of life and there is a mention of verse in the Quran that says that you must not say off to your parents and, yeah. if they, and look after your parents like they looked after you yeah. when you were young. And if they live, this is not, a, it may be a combination of two eyes, I'm not sure, please don't quote me, but if they live long enough until they reach old age, and mm. they become infirm and like a young child again. Right. Right. Then then that is like the cycle of life. Yes. Yes. And so grandma became, went through the whole cycle of life to the right. extent that she became like an absolute child oh, and yeah. needed everything done mm -hmm. for her. So when I bought this painting, I titled it myself. I know it's a hearse. <laughs> and I know it's called Sineal, that's fine. But to me, that painting is titled The Circle of Life. Oh. Because I thought of my grandmother right. in that painting. Yeah. No, because I was looking throughout the whole interview, I'm looking at this picture behind you and I feel <laughs> like I'm diving into that picture. No, sure, I feel sure. like I'm getting drawn. I mean, I was, it's beautiful colours, they're my colours. But I feel like I am mesmerized and being drawn I don't know, I don't know hypnotized but I just feel like it. I'm going in that picture yeah. yeah but how wonderful thank you for that explanation and uh... welcome Mariam to my studio this is where I spend most of my time um, seven days a week and it can start from any time from eight o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night and when I was doing my exhibition for the Saatchi Gallery, 
Um, sorry, before I do go into that, this is the most latest works of mine. It's a chessboard with chess pieces that I designed and had made by a 3D printer. And I shall tell you about this the next time we speak and the next time if we have a follow up on the podcast of that particular series of mine. However, when um, I was doing my um, exhibition for the Saatchi Gallery, I was up here, I was down here rather in my studio, um, working till two o'clock in the morning. The best thing I ever did was to bring my studio to the house. Um, this is my workspace, this is where I do all my admin and all my emails and all that sort of work. It's where my assistant sits when she comes over. Um, this is the other side of my studio. Um, I normally, this is all mostly work in progress, um, this side of the studio. And then over here um, is my gallery. And this is where I have complete works, finished works. And so everything in here is for sale. Um, this is titled um, Life After Death and the verse in this painting is God sends down water from the sky and with it gives life to the earth after it has died. So I thought this was really a lovely um, verse from the Quran which I um, applied into this painting of mine and titled it Life After Death. These are my finished works for my new series of work titled Unity which is all part of the, um, the chess pieces that I just showed you. And these are some other pieces of work of mine that are complete. This is from the Cosmic series. Um, Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, um, repeated because like in Sufism, there's a lot of thicker, a lot of repetition of the praises of Allah. So I thought this was a really nice way of um, in, including a practice of Sufism into my work. And the same over here. And again, these are part of my new series of work titled Unity. These are some assemblages which I made during the first lockdown. And I really enjoyed doing this. It's like creating three piece, um, a three dimensional piece of art on a two dimensional surface. So this is all to do with raw division and I titled the exhibition Unity as a paradox to what's happening in the world today. And this is the 99 Games of Allah. Hope you enjoyed this virtual tour of mine. Well, I don't know whether it's virtual or not, but the tour of my studio. All the best. So what are you planning to do in these next few years? Do you have some um, other uh, plans uh, for your your uh, art and where, where do you see yourself? Well, at the moment, um, having physical exhibitions and physical galleries is, yeah. is a bit of a, um, a no starter mm. because a lot of time organization and money goes into putting on an art exhibition in a gallery yes and yes. I think a lot of galleries are a bit apprehensive in committing to that because if I just don't know yeah. notice, you know they yeah. a show can just be called off I mean you know you've got the big institutions that are going through that at the moment yeah leave aside the smaller commercial galleries so a lot of things are happening online so I've just, um, and I only, I only sell my work through exhibitions. Mm. Um, and so I've just started putting my work on the Saatchi online art, Saatchi online art platform. Right, okay. Art Finder uh, um, online platform. Yeah. And um, there are other online art galleries and exhibitions, but I need, right. to, have, I need to find time to sort of, research those a bit more. right right i was supposed to have had two exhibitions last year in 2021 in june and one in november in mm -hmm. italy but they both got cancelled 
And so now I'm just waiting to hear from the curators from, from Italy as to what their program is for this yeah. year and next year. So mm -hmm. I'm working on, um, I've just finished working on a, on a series titled Unity. So, and then I'm, and I'm going to start a new series of work in the next month or so. I normally get inspired during Ramadan because that's when all my social life is completely at a standstill. Yeah, Ramadan's coming up soon. So I wish you have a fabulous Ramadan. And Thank you. I wish you this day. Being part of our 50th, you know, I wanted to celebrate something that, and, and kind of anchor that 50th episode with a guest that I absolutely adore as well. So, oh. you know, take Thank care you. of yourself. And, uh, you know, I'm waiting for the next exhibition <laughs> in real. In, in so real am I, life. so am I, I know, I know, so am I. I can't yeah. wait, that, there's something special, you know, having exhibitions and seeing people and just having that whole, that, that, that's a different, different world itself. But um, thankful for every moment that we have. And inshallah, inshallah, pray for everybody to be safe and healthy and uh, until we meet next but, time. Um, oh my gosh, we could talk and talk and talk. Really Honestly, I absolutely subject. love speaking to you in the talk. You know, it's such a, because we're talking about, you know, creative forms. We're talking about, uh, you know, Islam, religion. Uh, you're just such wonderful experiences that I always say that your the the revolution starts within you inside you know exactly. everybody has to start from themselves forget yeah. about everybody else your relationship with yourself and Allah yeah. is the most yeah. profound that you yeah. need and everybody else yeah. they, they'll come in in and out of your you life. know when you when you actually take the trouble of getting to know Allah mm. you then begin to know yourself oh, yes absolutely you know That's and but, but then but then also you will never ever be able to know Allah in its true sense and you will never able to know yourself in your in its true self sense mm -hmm. because one is always evolving evolving one should always evolve life evolves yes you should evolve you should never plateau yeah and so um on that note <laughs> um, Art Why is and spirituality weird. are two subjects that are very close to my heart. Thank you, Mariam, and stay blessed. Thank you so much. Take care.